Victorian death obsession was driven by Queen Victoria's grief over the passing of her beloved husband, Prince Albert. In honor of her husband, she wore black and stark colors until her own passing in 1901. Her devotion to his memory set the standard by which society handled their own mortality. Standards were also driven by the idea that purgatory was non-existent, and the choice for the dying was only between heaven and hell. This change in religious belief gave rise to the concept of lingering death, where the declining person must prepare for the next world. Victorian England was driven by the idea of a good death, an elaborate and strict set of Victorian practices requiring painstaking detail and a small fortune. Failing to properly mourn on a grand scale was considered a societal and moral failure. Considering that there was a high mortality rate at the dawn of the 19th century, especially among children, at around 50%, families found themselves perpetually ensconced in this macabre business during the Victorian era. Victorian mourning etiquette was especially tough for women. Widows were required to embody grief. They were expected to mourn their husbands for at least two years, cloaked in dark clothing and isolated from society. Every detail of their lives was dictated by social pressure to live in a state of never-ending grief. There were also Victorian death traditions we might find odd today. But at the time, they made perfect sense. Mirrors were covered to prevent trapping the deceased soul in their reflection. Family portraits and photos were covered or flipped to prevent the person's spirit from possessing the living. The deceased's hair was put into clothing and jewelry and worn by mourners. The stringent Victorian traditions waned with Queen Victoria's passing. The advent of national conflict, the flu pandemic, and an increased interest in cremation. As morbid as Victorian mourning etiquette seems, some of these rituals are still around today, in one form or another. Families posed for portraits with the recently deceased. The invention of the daguerreotype in 1839 by Louis-Jacques Mondet Daguerre gave rise to post-mortem photographs. A common practice would be to pose the deceased in a realistic domestic setting. Adults were posed in a setting that reflected their profession as naturally as possible. Children were posed with family members, sometimes with a toy or sitting with a sibling, oftentimes as though they were sleeping. The deceased were sometimes posed standing, with the aid of hidden clamps and stands. In rare cases, open eyes would be painted on top of closed eyelids. Since photography was expensive, a post-life photo might be the only photo the family had of the deceased. Grieving parents would create lifelike doll versions of their deceased infants. Following the passing of babies and young children, families would sometimes commission mourning or grave dolls. These were usually realistic wax effigies that would be dressed in the deceased child's clothing and sometimes even incorporate the deceased child's own hair. The dolls had soft cloth bodies filled with sand that had a lifelike weight and feel and flat backs so that they would lie neatly in their coffins. The dolls were usually left at the child's grave site, but some families would keep them in the home as a memento, in a small glass coffin, a frame, or even a crib. Little girls would practice mourning with funerary dolls. During the Victorian era, women were tasked with the complicated business of mourning. According to the Encyclopedia of Children and Childhood in History and Society, it's not surprising that these macabre customs greatly influenced even children. By the 1870s, death kits were available for dolls, complete with coffins and mourning clothes, as a means of helping to train girls for participating in, even guiding, Death rituals and their attendant grief. In addition, many books and pictures geared towards children emphasize the duties of families in times of grief. The fear of accidental burial created. A market for safety coffins. Medicine was still operating in the gray area of experimentation during the Victorian era. And there were many stories of people being buried alive after falling into a vegetative state dubbed sleeping sickness. The person would recover after several days, 
only to discover they were ensconced in their coffin. Understandably, there was the widespread fear of premature burial. Several Victorian-era coffin designs addressed this fear. One included placing a bell in the deceased's hand, which was attached to a ring, and then running the line out of the coffin and up to the top of the grave. If the person were to come to, they could ring the bell to signify they were alive. Simple, right? An American doctor, Dr. Timothy Clark Smith, was so terrified of being buried alive, he designed a 1414 glass window that looked down a six-foot shaft into his coffin. Ironically, he passed on Halloween in 1893. Mourners made jewelry out of their loved one's hair. Memento mori, meaning, remember that you have to die, were personal mementos and symbols of the deceased, such as masks, paintings, sculptures, and jewelry, meant to remind the mourner of the deceased and of their own mortality. Hair of the deceased would be worked into shadow boxes, wreaths, corsages, fabrics, paintings, and jewelry to be worn by the mourner. No mementos were to be worn during deep mourning, the first year, except for jet, a fossilized wood-like coal with a deep, shining black color. Graves were fortied against resurrection men who stole bodies. The medical need to understand illness and death caused a high demand for cadavers for medical training and dissection and to entertain the public that would gather to watch dissections. Because of this, grave robbing was rampant. With religious influence, family members feared that altering the physical body could have negative consequences for the spirit. According to history's The Rise of the Body Snatchers article, the practice of disturbing graves was all too common. A common trick of the trade was to burrow into the head end of the grave and drag the corpse out with a rope tied around its neck. A more subtle method was to dig a hole at a certain distance from the grave and tunnel the body out. Without anyone knowing the grave had been disturbed, the shroud and grave goods would often be left in the grave on removal of the body, as court sentences were lighter for body snatching alone. The wealthy built mausoleums and vaults, or encased grave sites with iron fortresses, to keep grave snatchers, called resurrection men, out. Those who couldn't afford such elaborate grave precautions would place stones or flowers on the grave to detect any movement in the soil that might betray a theft, or dig branches and brambles into the grave to make tunneling more difficult. Sometimes the deceased's friends would even guard the grave at night. Professional mourners were hired to amp up the grief at services. Having the most austere and elaborate funerary services was not only a duty but an unspoken competition among prominent families in Victorian society. Professional mourners, or mutes, were hired to trail behind the coffin or hover near and look especially forlorn. Dickens's fictional Oliver Twist was one such mute, hired to mourn at children's burial ceremonies. Professional mourners provided a sense of solemnity to the affair while also allowing the grieving family to keep up the stiff appearance the tradition required. Despite the great emphasis on grief in Victorian culture, it was still considered unseemly to publicly cry, particularly loudly, at services. Victorians enjoyed picnics in cemeteries. According to writer Kira Butler of the Midnight Society, the popularity of elaborate burial traditions affected the social perception of once macabre settings. For a reprieve from the city, families in mourning turned to cemeteries to spend their quiet afternoons, designed like public parks, with their Gothic revival mausoleums and Egyptian-inspired colonnades. The cemeteries became a place to spend a Sunday afternoon where families might spread a blanket in a patch of shade and socialize with others who'd come to visit with their loved ones at rest. Of course, this wasn't merely because the Victorians were obsessed with post-life, even if they were. In an overcrowded, dingy city like London, cemeteries were clean, comfortable, wide-open spaces filled with greenery, so it's easy to see their appeal as recreation areas. Families started saving for funerals, while their relatives were still alive and healthy.
Previously, post-life services were arranged between the family and the church and were small private affairs. In the Victorian age, a burial ceremony was expected to be a long, elaborate, and public process, requiring a director, hired black horses for the hearse, elaborate floral displays, invitations, crepe, pallbearers, professional mourners, photographs, and a large feast for mourners. Families, particularly among the lower classes, began to set aside funds for an impending passing and the subsequently required pageantry. Many times the family might refuse to dip into the funerary fund for basic daily necessities, ironically causing the death of a family member. According to Join Me in the 1900s, the stigma of a pauper's burial was so great that families would go without food and heating in order to put by a penny a week for each child, two for the mother and three for the father towards funeral expenses. Mirrors were covered to prevent those passed from being trapped. There was a widely held superstition that mirrors could trap the deceased person, so all the mirrors in the house would be covered in black cloth. Some also argued this helped prevent vanity among the bereaved living in the house. Essentially, the focus would be completely on those who passed and not those who were still living. Often, family photos and paintings would also be turned upside or turned to face the wall.